So we really wanted to establish a value for the farmer. We wanted to establish a value for their produce. And we wanted to really create this education where people felt more connected to food at their source and therefore valued it differently. Good morning, small but mighty How We Work family. This is Issa, your podcast host. So I want you to imagine for a moment, you're in your early 20s. You get invited to meet a man at a farm who's supposedly like putting on some kind of food event, like some kind of outdoor dinner, something you haven't really heard much about before. You really haven't seen anybody else who's done it. And you decide, having met him and really enjoying the experience of the dinners he puts on, to help him out, to hop on a bus, and then for years to travel around the country putting on huge outdoor dinners for hundreds of people. Long communal tables. Sometimes these dinners are on beaches where you have to wade across the high tide to get a boat to get the guests out or you show up at a farm and the chef's not there they don't know how to cook the food because the chef has never really cooked outside before what you end up doing is starting really the whole farm dinner movement in a lot of ways the way we think about like local food farmers markets all this kind of stuff that we just take for granted right now this woman who is on this podcast that I'm about to interview really was one of the people who started all that stuff. Now, she's very humble and wouldn't take credit for it because in a lot of ways, you know, she was one of many people starting these things. But she just took off on this amazing adventure. And it's just, it's it's really exciting to hear about. So this woman, Katie, is someone who I've known for a long time. So she actually worked with me for a long time on my underground dinners. I used to do these big, like, 100-person, eight-course tasting menu dinners called the Wild Kitchen. Um, And we would do them in warehouses and houseboats and rooftops. And people would get the address of the dinner the day of. So, you know, they didn't know where it was going to be. It was uh, was a really nice experience. Um, And she really brought an amazing skill to it. She was a really great partner in it. And that's what this podcast is about. It's about her experience. She's done a lot since then as well. You know, she also has worked with FEMA to help hundreds of thousands of people get food during the pandemic in Santa Cruz, connecting with local farmers. She just has this like amazing way of connecting things. It's a skill that when we were working together, I was very impressed by. And it's just really impressive to hear her talk about it and hear her story. So that's all I'll say. I hope you're doing good. Thanks so much for listening and enjoy the episode. So Katie, thanks again so much for coming on the podcast. It's great to have you here. Of course, we know each other very well. We worked together for years and years, which was a pleasure. But could you give a little kind of like cliff notes of what you've been up to so far in this life? Oh my gosh, I'm going to attempt for a succinct version of that. Mm. (laughs) in my many years so far on this planet. Well, I grew up on the East Coast and I was part of a large family, the eldest of five. And so, you know, in my early 20s, I migrated West and took on a myriad of jobs, paying off school loans and traveling. And as those years passed, I realized that I had a passion for gatherings, growing up with a large family and gathering around the table during the evening or with extended family of 30 or 40 people. That was that was my passion. So I sort of started with outstanding in the field, working in that. In my 20s, I'd worked in restaurants for many years in all parts of the house, so front of house, back of house. And I started to have friends ask me about helping them plan significant gatherings, and, and that evolved into getting into the farm-to-table world, growing outstanding in the field, so traveling within California, across the country, and then internationally, bringing people out to their food source and educating them about it. And then from there, oh my gosh, we work together with Forage SF and the Wild Kitchen Project. I've started a few small businesses. One that's still running is a small bean-to-bar craft chocolate business in Santa Cruz, California. And then in between there, I've taken up all sorts of smaller, spontaneous projects. So I have a number of clients and organizations, nonprofits that I work with to plan gatherings. So could you 
talk a little bit about your experience of outstanding in the field. I mean, I think it's just, it's a fascinating story about kind of like taking a bus around the country and creating these dinners that started such a movement. Yeah, I mean, it feels like a lifetime ago. So in the early 2000s, I met Jim Denvin. We both live in Santa Cruz, California, and I had a very dear friend who said, hey, would you like to head out to this farm? You know, maybe it was an hour outside of town and help with this dinner. That's about all I knew as I got into the car with my dear friend Sarah, and we drove up to this farm, and as we arrived... (laughs) I remember seeing two middle-aged gentlemen outside. They were a little bit of a hot mess after they'd slept all night by this large pit they dug and buried a pig, and they were cooking it. And that was David Kinch, who has Manresa Restaurant, and also Jim Denovan of Outstanding in the Field. So that was Jim's brother's farm. It was one of the first dinners he'd done, and it was a wildly exhausting and fabulous experience. And a few weeks later, I received a phone call and Jim said, hey, could you help me put together some dinners? So I think at that time, I didn't realize it was how much it was in the beginning of the movement, right? So I went over to Jim's little east side surf shack and we chatted and he pulled out a piece of paper that had 10 names on it all written in pencil and you know this was really before you were using cell phones right so technology was pretty limited if you wanted directions you would print them out on MapQuest (laughs) so this was his mailing list of 10 names and he had some ideas for some dinners that he wanted to do but nothing was planned and and it went from there you know and growing up in a large family and kind of rolling with things organically as you have to do. It ended up being a very good fit. And so we started from there. And that next year, we ended up buying a bus on sellabus.com up in Oregon, which Caleb, our amazing bus driver, drove down. I think it caught on fire on the way down, but it made it to Santa Cruz. We (laughs) painted it. We did some level of minimal decor inside because we knew we were all going to be living on it. And we took off across the country. So early 2000s, you remember, was really the height, you know, was the boom of the Food Network. So you Mm -hmm. had chefs that were elevated, really, but the farmers really weren't. So our goal was to educate sort of that step pre-chef about the ingredients and about the value of what folks were doing. So it was a wild ride. We found out that that bus belonged to Elvis back in the day. <laughs> no way. <laughs> it was a pretty wild discovery. That's why you guys discovery. were so successful, you yeah. know, and got that Elvis energy. Yeah. We must have had something yeah. along those lines. I remember it had, you know, it was a pretty basic setup for all of us to live together. It was very intimate. So I needed an office space for all of the phone calls on the flip phone. And so the restroom, we actually, <laughs> we didn't use the restroom. It was just, it was, it was too old of a vehicle. So we actually took a recliner we found on the side of the road and gutted the base and set it over the toilet area. <laughs> <laughs> and then I took a music stand and put that over the sink. And so I would spend many hours a day watching the country go by outside of that little window planning dinners. So yeah, yeah, it was a wild beginning and the movement really took hold. I mean, I would say with that movement, it took a village, right? I think when you know there's a great idea out there, it enrolls a number of people for a number of reasons. And so I really always give credit to the village for that movement. And it continues to go on Outstandings now doing hundreds of dinners nationally and internationally, which is really amazing. Wow. What an adventure that sounds like, you know, (laughs) like what a cool thing to do, right? Like, it's uh, yeah like what what do you think so i think a lot of people would have been presented with that situation there's this guy that you don't really know very well who's starting this thing <laughs> that like no one's really done before and not taken that kind of plunge like what do you think motivated you to be like yep i'll like get on that bus and make this thing happen and work on it for years and years and like like pretty <laughs> uncomfortable living situation yeah. and Yeah, it's just a very brave act. Like, what do you think? What do you feel like motivated you to do that? Thank you. Yeah, you know, I don't know if I thought twice about it. And maybe those are just the good organic fits for us as individuals and communities and moving forward. I also really attribute that. I mean, I adore my family and I really am thankful for my my childhood because I was really taught to embrace um, adventure. There was no reason for me not to. I mean, we would be on tour for months on end, and it was 
brutal work, you know, now. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I know that kind of work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know <laughs> you that know? work. But, but, right? you're, but you're, that's the thing. So our dinners were a lot of work. I just can't even imagine. It's like if you, you had the <laughs> bus with all this stuff, like so much harder. You're like on farms and, and like, yeah, just oh, it's yeah. quite The variables quite were steep, yeah, right? Now sure. you sort of Google really quickly where you can find propane in your area, yeah, right? Yeah. That was not possible. Mm -hmm. So I would be, and then there was no auxiliary vehicle. You know, we really didn't have any money. If we had enough gas to get to the next town, congratulations. You know, when we started, um, hosting dinners, setting the iconic long tables in California and across the country. It, it took a minute to enroll chefs and artisans and farmers in the concept, right? Because if there was a dinner outdoors, most people assumed it would be a potluck and a fundraiser of some sorts, right? So we really wanted to establish a value for the farmer. We wanted to establish a value for their produce and we wanted to really create this education where people felt more connected to food at their source and therefore valued it differently. You know, I think that people in the early 2000s had this food network rock star chef ideal, fabulous, great. But really on top of that, our goal was to kind of take things to the next level and, and educate people uh, that really, as any great chef will say, they're only as good as the product that they're working with. So when we started across country, I think chefs were excited about that concept, but really what got them out to the field was the idea that they would have this opportunity to meet the farmer in person and see the land that this food would be, was being grown on, which many of them had never met or seen the farm or met the farmer from which they've been sourcing for years. So one of my favorite chefs, Paul Cahan, based in Chicago, Blackbird, a few other restaurants, he was probably one of the first upper level, let's call it mission chefs to say, okay, great, I'm in. And on top of that, I'm going to close my restaurant and bring my full team out to the farm for the weekend. So uh -huh. we would have the pastry chef in this little farm kitchen at Knicknick Farm and the whole team out there wandering the fields. And it was really this beautiful experience. And I remember that event, gosh, 2004, perhaps, you know, this pivotal moment where at the end of the night, the guests had departed and looking at this candlelit table and realizing that the only folks left at the table were the chefs, the farmers, and the food artisans. At that time, really what kept you going was the team and those farmers. And so, yeah, I remember at that time saying every year reevaluating, okay, why am I doing this? What am I doing Am I happy with this? And, and I remember looking back and thinking, at the end of my life, what do I think will be the most valuable part of the years? And I, and I was very clear that gatherings with people you loved or people that you didn't even know, but those gatherings themselves were what I truly believed were the apex for me as an individual, for my community. So I, I putting in those years of work, there, there was value right there for that. That was very beautifully put, Katie. <laughs> Thank like, you, you, know, really, like you, just, you kind of like paint such a like such a, a rich picture of that experience. And, I, and it's really interesting, too. I mean, I've thought this for, for about you for a long time. But like all this stuff, like farmers markets, farm to table dinners, like the stuff that we did together, the underground dinners, just this kind of appetite for people to have these new kind of food experiences where they connect with the people cooking or the people who are growing the ingredients or foraging them. Like all that seems like very obviously popular now. Mm -hmm. Like you kind of like understand that this is something that people are really interested in. But what's so fascinating is like you guys started it. <laughs> you know, like, like, like it, it's really interesting hearing about when you were first doing it, right? Because it's this new idea. Now it feels very obvious to people, but like trying to convince people that this is even something they should do. Yeah, it's just, it's really, it's very impressive. Like I've always been very impressed oh, by it. Thank you, romantic. So you could say all the reasons why it wouldn't work. And at the same time, there was just such a beautiful momentum. The work was hard you know, and it was a little mm. bit thankless. Like I was more connected to it because I had the relationship and I was building those relationships with the artisans and the chefs and the farmers. 2 a.m. you're lugging tables with a headlamp on and, you know, everyone thought we ate well, but really we're eating 
beef jerky from Love's Truck Stop. There was no way for us to eat well because most of the chefs under prepared less food than guests needed. And so we were just because they didn't know better. And so usually, yeah, it was, <laughs> you know, I always think about that. Yeah, uh, I could get a hard boiled egg, an unripe banana or some beef jerky at Love's Truck Stop. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and really, then we were promoting yeah. this idea of local food. So anyway, yeah, there's a lot of, of fun yeah. tales to be had. That sounds like a really great adventure. <laughs> yeah, and I wonder, I mean, I think a lot about this. We were talking before about how you're interested in starting a podcast. And like, I think about it with the projects that I work on. Like anything that I've ever done, there are more reasons why it won't work than it will, right? And mm -hmm. like anyone you ever talk to is like, well, these are the reasons you shouldn't do this, obviously. Mm -hmm. Like obviously this is a bad idea, but you just kind of like push through that. And I wonder, I wonder where that comes from. Like what, like why do some people push through in ideas that seem like they shouldn't work and why do some people not? Or... Like, how do you know the difference of a good idea that you just need to keep pushing at and just a straight up bad idea? And you should listen to your you should listen to the good advice of your friends and family. <laughs> like, you ever think about that? It's a great question. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of vague, interesting. Yeah. <laughs> no, I love it. It's yeah. interesting for me because my experience working with you, Isa, and the, all the work you've done, I'm just always so inspired because I think you really spearhead things and you'll say, hey, I'm thinking about doing this and you and you do it. And I feel, you know, it's really wild because for me, I come upon these ideas and then I'm, if I, it feels right, I'm enrolled and then I'm in, but I can get a little bit more paralyzed. If it's just me with that idea, I get paralyzed. I can think of all the reasons mm -hmm. why not. So for me, I know it's this community momentum, you know, that's kind of my personal philosophy as I see these projects that sort of help weather, which is what you're very great at doing, connecting people, connecting us to one another, connecting us to different components of the planet. I really have realized that I rely on that community feedback, whether it's just like an excitement I see in someone or people saying, how can I help? Mm. Yeah, I think that's that's a really good way to think about it. It's something that I do too. Like if I have an idea, I'll just start talking to everyone I meet about it. Yeah. Like I'm like bouncing. I'm just like bouncing it off everyone. And like some people are like, that's just stupid. Why would you ever do that? I'm like, okay, that's like, that's some feedback. And then I bounce it off some other people and they're excited about this one part of it. And I'm like, oh, okay. It's like how the thing kind of comes alive is, is bouncing it off everybody in the world. And so, yeah, I mean, it's similar in a way like the, like I kind of, rely on the community in that way, but for ideas that kind of come from me. Mm -hmm. So for myself, what I, I jokingly, but also in true earnest, refer to myself in life as a gap filler. So I think mm. about it. So I'll give this example. We have this small bean to bar chocolate shop in Santa Cruz, super mom and pop, right? Maybe we have two employees. The pandemic rolls around, right? Which I'm sure you may have had guests who've had business during the pandemic. But as a small business, it was a roller coaster. You know, I'm thankful. I, I felt like I could see the writing on the wall. So we were the first business to close down in Santa Cruz. And we regrouped and reopened and kind of became this place that people could come throughout the pandemic. A lot of people who lived alone, honestly, and couldn't see anyone else. So they'd come in per all the protocols and get their, you know, little cup of sipping chocolate. You want to know a random tidbit about craft chocolate? Just because. Yes, please. <laughs> so <Yeah>. chocolate, <laughs> this this stimulant in cacao, which is the source of chocolate, the origin, the bean, is theobromine. And theobromine is one hydrogen bond off from caffeine. So it is, it can really get you going. So often we mm. don't have that experience with chocolate because if there is the per small percentage of cacao that's often in a chocolate bar is pretty heavily roasted, often pressed under high heat to separate the fats and the fibrous portion. And so at the end of the day, you're not, you don't have much actual oomph to your cacao. But if you're eating real chocolate, or I should say chocolate with a higher percentage, it can, it can really get you going. And that's why they say dogs shouldn't mm. have it. This is just one more fact. Interesting. When they say dogs yeah. shouldn't have chocolate, it's because if they can eat a bunch of Hershey's. That's fine. But it's still, it doesn't have the theobromine. And it's the theobromine that gives them a heart attack. Isn't that horrible? 
and random. Mm, yeah, that is horrible. Yeah. <laughs> don't let your little doggies eat chocolate, real chocolate. <laughs> but anyway, ba- back to the point of that story was we had this small mm. business, the pandemic rolls along, and then that summer we have an inc- the CZU fires in Santa Cruz. So all the businesses shut down with the fires. And as you know, we've fire season has been increasingly common now, but at that time, even three or four years ago, it was a new protocol for us. So I had a friend who worked with Jose Andres World Central Kitchen, and she gave me a call, and, she, and everyone was, a lot of people in Santa Cruz and the mountains had already evacuated. And she said, World Central Kitchen's coming into town. Do you think you can just help orient them? to the to place, right? Can you just help them figure out what resources they need and get them settled? And I said, sure. You know what? Have them meet me at the chocolate shop. We'll make them a nice breakfast. We'll give them, you know, espresso, cacao, whatever they need, and we'll help connect them with local resources. So we they end up rolling into town and that welcome into the shop ends up turning into them basing their operations out of the shop. And so, and the shop was closed at this time because of the fires. And then it evolved into us preparing meals out of the kitchen, certified kitchen that's in the chocolate shop space and Mutari's chocolate shop space. And then it evolved into, you know, I realized at that time, oh my gosh, we need a headquarters for this. So then I just started calling different chefs in the area whose restaurants were closed and saying, hey, meals need to be prepared. There's a stipend coming from the state calling the farmers and having them after the farmer's market drop off any produce they hadn't sold so we could support the farmers, support local chefs, and then building at the end of the day, I think I was able to, it was over $300,000 went back to the local community, 30,000 meals. But I guess that's my point. It's gap filling, right? You kind of see there's this momentum and then sort of saying, hey, what needs to happen to connect these dots? And create something helpful and useful. It's a really amazing skill. Yeah. It's like when you say gap filler, it just feel, it just feel a bit reductive in some <laughs> way. Right. But I think that, but I mean, when you expand on what you mean, I think that that really is like your core skill set in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. Like when you, when we're, we're, when we work together, you know, at the wild kitchen dinners, it's like, you just have this ability to like pull things together and smooth things out and figure things out in a way that I think is pretty unique. Like what you're just saying about, about what you did with World Central Kitchen. Honestly, I think most people would have, and honest, I'll include myself, would have been very nervous about that ask. <laughs> you know, like here's someone very famous coming and it's like a really big deal. And like, oh, you, like you just got to like meet this person and figure it out. I feel it's, cool not have that inhibition. I mean, honestly, it's all Yeah, timing, like it's very it's, impressive. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, yeah. part of that momentum was World Central Kitchen's amazing, but they come in for that beginning disaster relief portion and they are nonprofit, right? So they have donations and funds. They then leave and pass the baton to the local community. So their structures, I really love it. And then basically FEMA, the state, they come in and they say, okay, great, We've got this funding. And so when World Central Kitchen left, you know, I had proposed this idea, let's give money to local chefs. It's pandemic. It's fire. They need the support. The farms need the support. And they said, great, here's the baton. Hop on this call. What I didn't know was I was getting on the call with the head of the Red Cross, the head of FEMA. And I learned about this whole other industry called feeders that exist. So it was really this crash course And it ended up lasting for three months where I learned an immense amount about these disaster relief food systems. So yeah, I'm thankful. I just sort of said, okay, great. I'm the sponge. What can I learn and how can I help? And luckily, fortunately, I had a skill set that lended a hand. Yeah. What do you think you learned about about that system? Because I remember when I heard you talking about doing that, I was like, that is incredibly impressive that you're making that happen. Because it feels like I'm in the food world, we're in the food world, but that like disaster relief FEMA government stuff feels like it's like on this other side, you know, like it doesn't feel like something I have connection to by any means. And yet, what do you think about that, that system? 
having worked within it? Oh my gosh, great question. I and I really I didn't know anything about it either. I, I really just felt like I was very fortunate to have the yeah, opportunity no one to learn. No, and it's going to become yeah. with shifting global, with where we're at and the momentum we have with shifts in our climate. There's a reality to that, right? That we're going to have to kind of think ahead about these potential, whether it's larger storms, fires, etc. So I think that. I went back to my roots, which is community, right? So what I really saw was that there were these feeders, which were really bigger companies that went into disaster zones wherever they were and made a business of feeding airline-style foods funded by the state. It was crazy. So normally you're just feeding people at shelters in, in bulk. We were delivering individual meals to rooms which then it's a slippery slope with how long that food can be all right outside of a refrigerator and the hotels didn't have refrigerators. So there was a lot of areas to troubleshoot. And then we were working with FEMA, communicating with Red Cross. They operate with very different communication systems, both great organizations doing great things. Um, so I think I just really realized there's still this huge gap. That's what I'd say. Anyone out there, this is real, this exists, which is People want to do good. These organizations, there are many that want to contribute. There is some great funding, but the food waste, because the food gets delivered, there's no place to store it. And they are instructed that if this doesn't get served in X amount of hours, it gets thrown out. So, I mean, mm. I would talk to shelters that said there was just food sitting, wasting in numerous places because they weren't allowed to serve it given health, safety, and protocol. I understood all that on all levels, but it was just pretty heartbreaking, right, to see the level of waste that existed. So it reinforced my humans are really, in general, good people and want to do good things. And it's really about this kind of breakdown in systems. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's about filling the gaps. It's about filling the gaps. We have a it's lot why of you're perfect. everything you're out perfect there. for it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we That's really do. Cool. No. We're all fortunate. You know, we have an incredible amount of resources. And I think like we often get in this idea of what can I do that's different and new? And that can be great. But again, often you don't need to recreate the wheel. It's just like, how do we get these ideas and concepts into people's lives more, more readily? Yeah. Let me ask you, I feel like everyone has a kind of thread that connects all their projects together. And what do you think that thread is for you? It's mm, a really great question. I mean, feels like low fruit to say community, though that feels true. The connecting theme is that it's an interweaving of, you know, all of these inspirational parts of life, right? Whether this amazing produce or this phenomenal foraged item, and then this person who's had this incredible history and stories to share. And I think it's just a version of storytelling, right? Whether it's through an evacuee meal that gets sent to someone that talks about the restaurant and the farm, whether it's farm dinners, you know, I have a handful of clients that I do private work for, and that's always my goal is to connect them to place. So I don't know if that answers that question. Yeah, no, that's well said. I like that you talked about your kind of like visual perfection and your desire to like pull everything together for these moments. I feel like that definitely speaks to our experience doing the underground dinners we work together on and any kind of event, right? Like in some ways on paper, it doesn't make sense to organize events. Like you generally <laughs> don't make that much money. It is like so yeah. much work. Yeah. Right. And like, like kind of, why are you doing it? Right. I feel like that really crystallizes the motivation in a way it's for this moment where everything comes together like all these ideas come together and these people come together and there's like these few moments like the moment you were talking about like after the dinner when the chefs and the farmers are sitting together at the table it's like all that work and then this thing comes together that feels like it might grow something and grow something new yeah yeah thank you for pointing that out because I think for me just even hearing you say that just gives me goosebumps right and brings tears to my eyes because that really there is a moment with every gathering, you know, for me, where it turns to slow motion, just even for a minute, right? And I look around and it just feels like um, everything's magnified, if that makes sense, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's like bringing everything, like something I was thinking about when you were talking, it's like bringing everything into focus, mm -hmm. right? Like there are these moments in life 
And so maybe it can be an event you're putting on or it can be a like really beautiful moment in a relationship you're having or like you take a cross country trip or like travel around the world and like you're always looking for these like moments of focus, right? Where like everything just like comes together. These are the moments you like really, really remember. And maybe like event organization is almost trying to like force those moments in a way. Like yeah. to be like, okay, I'm going to bring all these things together. I'm going to create this moment for people. And it's going to be a moment that like they'll remember because it will be like a moment that like came into focus. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you never know if and when that arises for folks. You know, I always say with event planning that a hundred percent of it for me, at least in the logistics and also vision, a hundred percent of that matters up until the day of the event. And then the day of the event Hopefully, 50% of that will be helpful. And the remaining portion is fully, uniquely up to that group, that momentum, that day uniquely. And my job at that point is to make sure that I just kind of help guide that organically so that it's not felt, but at the same time that there's some grounding that people have. They know things are being managed, but really it's about that organic flow. There are things you just cannot change in the event world, right? There are things that are going to come up. And the beauty, when you get to this place in planning where you realize, I am not going to change that, you know, and outstanding in the field really put me there, right? Because I want, I had all the details in place and oh my gosh, often Jim was the bane of my existence, you know, because he's really a visionary. He's a phenomenal sand artist, phenomenal. And I also outstanding in the field, that organization is not his strong suit. And it really took a village to keep that going. And Jim is great at that vision portion, but that guy, he loved the table would be fully set. We'd have people working the event in the beginning, everyone just volunteered. And then he'd decide... And he, and he was right most of the time that like, oh, it would look better at this angle. And so he, the visual was there, but I just remember that that last minute shuffle in the moment held high stress. And at the end, I was just reminded and taught over and over the importance of really letting that go and realizing this is part of the process. Years ago, we did our first Sea Cove dinner and beach dinner with Outstanding. This was a long time ago. And I remember Jim and I were trying to figure out where to set the table and what angle. And he wanted to set the end of the table very close to the ocean. And we were talking about the impact of that, right? And I think this was back in the day I just started the private event leg. And this is when, oh my gosh, Evan, like the kids, the kids were all the same age. Twitter, the Twitter team, the OG Twitter team, right? We'd have a lot of these like newbie tech companies that were all in on the outstanding in the field experience, which was great. And, you know, I remember I was like, anti-cell phone. I'm like, here's the pillowcase. Let's put your cell phones in here for the dinner. And they would do it. Nowadays, people would not, oh, right? yeah. Good for so you. So I'm like, wow. all right, cell phones <laughs> yeah. in this bag. We're going to connect. And then, oh my God, there's so many wild memories. But yes, yeah, so then I remember though we had set the table and we realized that when the tide, <laughs> tide came in that you couldn't get back. <laughs> So, mm. you know, the dinner set, we're feeding people. We didn't realize Jim's pretty good about the tide, but we didn't realize it was coming in so far. So I remember I had to wade through this water and look for a boat and figure a way that I could rig this boat to go back and forth across this little inlet to bring us in and out. And those are the moments, right? That would, that level of improv, though it may have had some level of stress, there's also just this unique beauty to that event will never happen again. <laughs> <laughs> for a number of reasons. Yeah. But yeah, what yeah. we st what Outstanding still does and what I think is a great tradition is the long table, one end of it gets set right where the water will wash up on it. So the guests mm. sitting at that end of the table get really wet. And so it brings this kind of improv where they're helping to move their chairs and table out and it's this real interaction, right? And I think that is the beauty of gatherings is that unique participatory component. That's kind of what I've evolved over the years is you always need a participatory component. And sometimes it goes mm -hmm. better than you think it will. And sometimes not. Yeah. Yeah. You got to take that chance though. Right. Like if you think things through too much, they lose that mm -hmm. magic. Mm -hmm. I mean, they usually the in, in the moment improv is just the most authentic and yeah. there's a beauty. I mean, I thought the and wild so fun. And dinner. Yeah. You know? It's so much fun. I mean, it really, really is. Yeah. 
it's the same with food. The same with food of like you're in the kitchen and you've got a plan and then you all of a sudden, I remember once we didn't have dessert plates. And so this was at a farm dinner. There were fig trees and we ran around snipping little fig leaves to serve dessert on. Great. That worked out, fortunately. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I wonder if some, I wonder if like part of the attraction for guests is like almost their desire to break out of a way of being that is too streamlined, you know, like the idea that, that, that like a tech founder would be super an outstanding in the field, right? Like that person's an engineer. Like the way they think is you got to figure everything out first, figure out every eventuality, like everything's very clean, everything's very manageable in their work. And it doesn't mean it's not hard, but it's a lot different, right? And, but they come to these dinners and they're kind of like forced to improvise and they're, forced to kind of be part of this thing that is very, very different from the life they, from the life they lead. Like, I wonder if that, I wonder if that's some of the attraction in some way is like, take me out of myself for, for a couple hours. Yeah. I mean, that could be. And I do think people who are, you know, on, I mean, we'll speak to tech, we're in the Bay Area, companies that are in some ways breaking outside of molds, right? So they are thinking outside the box, even though they're writing code, et cetera. So I think they might have that approach to life in general. How can we become disruptors in a way? So I think in the tech, in tech specifically, I think there's a being drawn to that, which is a little different than what you were saying. But I think I will say mm. what I learned over the years is sometimes, at least when things just kind of get a little more mainstream, right? So, you know, there's always those people who are, you know, for me, when I travel, I'm looking for something so outside the box. I want to discover something new. And I think that I'll, when something becomes a little more approachable, like bean to bar chocolate, when it became just a little bit more common, there was more, honestly, what helped bean to bar chocolate was people understanding wine, so they had a vocabulary around terroir. They understood this concept of origin. You were seeing that more, whether that was related to farmer's markets, wine, olive oil. And so it kind of translated. Most people realized they love chocolate. We would have people coming into the chocolate shop just because they love chocolate. And it, then in that moment, it was this opportunity to educate them, which is amazing, right? I guess really it's the same thing with the wild kitchen dinners, right? Or the underground market. There's like these platforms that people, there's something that lures them, but then once they're there, this opportunity for education or opening, you know, ex exposing them and in, introducing them to something new occurs. And I think that's so classic, right? Because we have to feel comfortable enough to go into a situation. That's the reality. Maybe it's a friend's mm -hmm. bringing you to an event, maybe to a gathering, to the underground markets. But really, it's like something needs to get you there. Maybe you are infatuated with it, but I find more humans just need a thread of a thread of connection, something familiar. But then once they get there, it's this whole new world. That's kind of how I look at events, right? Or kind of the, those movements, if you will. Yeah, yeah. I think a lot about that. I feel like the way you talk about an idea is so, so important because if you introduce someone to an idea that feels really outside their scope, like you're not talking to them, you're talking at them about this thing that they need to know or that they should participate in or, or you make it feel like a little too cool kid, like people yep. aren't going to feel comfortable, like not going to come, right? Like you need to like speak to people like where they're at. Um, mm -hmm. That's something I've mm -hmm. always thought a lot about, like the kind of branding copy for lack of a better mm -hmm. word is like actually important because that's what makes people know it's for them, you know, and helps them mm -hmm. to get into a situation they might not otherwise have been in. Absolutely. You know? And I think that's especially important in the beginning stages. You know, I saw this with the farm to table movement. I've seen this with other movements, right? Once there's this mainstream, you know, I remember we were on the bus in Alaska and Kim Severson came to meet us in the Pacific Northwest. And that was a wild, wild ride and she went back to the city, wrote the piece on Outstanding in the Field, and there was no cell reception. I remember I stopped at a payphone to check the messages on the Outstanding in the Field line, right, which was essentially a answering machine. And, you know, everyone on that line and also my personal line kept, I was cracking up, calling me Wendy. And I thought, wow, they are call. I can't believe they don't know this is the wrong number until I realized that the New York Times had called me Wendy to Jim's Peter Pan, right? 
which is a different era. But the point is that article said it, the movement is significantly interesting. And then a GQ article after that set the movement as something on your checklist to do. And I'm referencing that because mm -hmm. I do think when something becomes culturally interesting and then mainstream takes it on, even the first press piece, whatever that looks like, then you get this whole world of people I always say, I don't actually care how you got here. I'm just happy they're there, right? Because then there's this captive audience that is open to learning, and it really doesn't matter why they're there. They do learn something new. They have a unique experience if if you steer the ship correctly. Yeah. Yeah. It's just people find kind of different ways in, right? Yeah. And it really doesn't, you know, um, it's, again, it doesn't matter how they get there. Totally. Yeah. It's all very cool. Here, I'm just going to ask you a couple more questions. Okay. Well, here, I'm going to ask you these. So I'm going to ask these questions, and these are questions I've kind of been asking everybody. Okay. And the idea is just to, like, finish the sentence. Okay. I love. Everything. Is that not an answer? I mean, I usually do love most things. Well, I love kindness. I love beauty. I love inspirational moments. Okay, those are all my answers you can choose. I think those are all going to go in. I think that was really good. Okay. I wish I had. I want to think uh, my go-to was I wish I was better at versus I wish I had. Oh my gosh, is it bad that I just don't know what I wish I had? I feel really fortunate in life. Like no, if I if good, there's something yeah. that I need, I feel fortunate to be able to make it happen. So I I wish I had less inhibition about pursuing my own projects. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. That's a really good one. I wish I hadn't. Mm, I'm sure at some point I wish I hadn't said that thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Is I'm there is there a specific that <laughs> thing or just generally yeah, just generally there were definitely times that oh I, my <laughs> gosh I can, yes I can definitely agree with you yes I think that in general I joke to myself about myself that I often just lay it out there and so and maybe I should be a little bit more intentional or have a bit different filter I mean I think I'm good in nuanced situations but there's definitely times I'm like ooh just no no shouldn't have said that. Mm. <laughs> Yeah. Not yeah. The I feel standard that. answer. Well, you know, I will say again. What? There is no standard answer. What's cool about these questions actually is like people give all kinds of different answers. Like they really kind of catch people off guard in this interesting way. <laughs> I mean, I wish I hadn't gotten malaria. But well, I can't there you even go. Yeah. I can't do that because I actually think I have this rapid drive immune system now because my fighter cells, you know, saved me. Mm. So yeah, I've heard that. Story. Well, that's the thing. There are things that it's kind of like what we were talking about with the dinners. This is a good general life lesson, right? It's like, yes, if you'd planned for it, you wouldn't wanted, you wouldn't have planned to walk through the water to try to find the boat, right? Like, right. There's no way you would plan for that in the same way that you would not plan to get malaria or not plan on some trip for something to happen, right? But actually all of those things needed to happen and all of those things feed into, into the life you're creating. So it's all positive. Yes. Yeah. I was talking to my mom last night and we had a memory of being in Sicily. My mom had never traveled outside of the country until I studied abroad down in Oaxaca, which was a long time ago, really just when the internet started, if we want to place it, you know, and the Mount Refugio was erupting and she and my sister and I, being young and experienced in travel, decided that, you know, we would drive up the mountain when everyone else was coming down. And I will say, we heard the earth breathe, you know, we were up close and personal with lava, but in retrospect, ho horrible idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally, yeah. <laughs> like drive up the side of an erupting volcano. Oh my but God. What a beautiful, a beautiful oh. moment of focus. Oh right? my, I'll never forget. If you have not been near a volcano before, hearing the earth breathe, it puts a lot in perspective. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. I'm most proud of. Mm. I'm most proud of my openness to learning. I think sometimes I can be the hardest on myself, but I do take pride and daily wanting to do better and be better. You know, I really thank my mom for that. You know, we, she really 
any time in life, she was the first to say, hey, I could have done that differently or better, and how can I do it? You know, how can I move forward in a different way? So I, I think I, I hold a lot of pride with that. I've seen it really, I think a lot of my long-term relationships, friendships, community have grown and evolved just because I think as humans, it can be difficult for us to do that. So I'm proud of that. Very well said. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Katie, for being on my podcast. You know, we worked together for years and I have always been so impressed by what you do. You as a person, like how kind you are, how you're able to just like guide the energy of a group of people in the right way. So I was really excited to talk to you. So yeah, thanks well, again. Iso, thank you. It's really been my pleasure and I always enjoy when we get to connect. So Thanks for having me on. This was, you made it seamless, my first podcast experience. So I think I could be one step closer to starting my own. So (laughs) you should, you should. And of course, I'm happy to chat about that anytime. Okay. Thank you. I hope I get to see you soon. And and I hope that something good comes from this podcast. Cool. Yeah. Thanks so much, Katie. Okay. Bye. Bye.